Dr. Perel, thank you so much for uh, joining us for the History of Retina um, interview. Uh, we appreciate your time this morning. My pleasure. You have a fascinating uh, story of uh, your journey uh, to the field of retina. Can you share with us uh, your career path of how you met up uh, with the field of retina? When I was 20 at the University of Bern, I met a, an op a professor in optics who told me there is a doctor in the organ clinic who wants to have help from a technician. Maybe you can help him. So I ended up working with Franz von Krauser, who was the pupil of Hans Goldman. And that's how, it's, how everything started. So although it's not retina, the first thing he asked me is, could you motorize the perimeter, the golden perimeter? And that was my first job. And the second one, which is more retina, is can you make a device to assess and measure the style Crawford effect? You know what the style Crawford effect is, right? It's when the retina starts to detach at the fovea, and that the cone no longer are uh, no longer focused onto the pupil. I didn't know that they were the, that was the way, but so optically we could do that. So I did it optically, and then decided Europe was too small, uh, and I spoke no English and. As Franz von Caso, could I go to America? And he says, uh, no, nobody speaks French in America. Learn English first. Of course, I could not have flown because I could not have afforded it. So there was an article in the newspaper that mentioned that Australia was offering to reimburse travel and expenses to any immigrant. So I ended up at the University of Melbourne Department of Ophthalmology and worked for Professor Croc. And Professor Croc first thing wanted to have a fundus camera because that was the best thing he had learned in at the Skeppens uh, department at the time, Masayane, Skeppens. Mm -hmm. So, fluorescent in geography, uh, he said, yeah, that's the thing we need to do for looking at the patient's retina and so on. And I said, okay, fine. Oh, and I wanted in stereo. And then he added, and I wanted recording. <laughs> so I used my engineering knowledge and made the first four frame a second fluorescein stereo fundus scan. And then looking at the retina, I noticed that it was not really flat and it was not really curved normally, but it had asperities up and down. And I uh, remembered having worked on or learn about stereo photogrammetry. So I went to a place in Melbourne, in, in the city, sorry, <clears throat> who actually made map of the city and the neighborhood uh, landscape. And they had that machine that could actually take stereo picture, put them on the plate and generate height information, in function of the distance. So I took the picture I had done on the stereo from the camera and we created the first three-dimensional map of a retina. 
Anyway, I did all kind of crazy stuff. Till one day, somebody said, oh, I cannot shoot your small vessels. Uh, I said, Why? He said, because they don't make any uh, suture thinner than seven, seven, oh. And I asked him, I said, how many micron is that? I don't know. Find out. I thought, I looked at um, books of chemistry at the University of Melbourne Library and found that if it is made of nylon, if you reach a certain temperature before melting, the, the material becomes stretchable. So I built a box, put two pulleys, put the 709 on other pulleys, a weight on each side, close the door, but underneath I had a, a heater, one of those cheap heaters. And I controlled the temperature with a thermostat that I built out of parts. And then all of a sudden, the, the suture became thinner and thinner and thinner. And I went all the way to 11.0. And the surgeon was so happy about it, he used his hand forceps to actually hold it. And the tweezer on the other side, and pop, thing broke. And when I looked at the forceps, they looked like giant powers. And the, the tweezers were sharp. And I said to myself, man, you need to do something else. So I figured out that, well, I had to replace the end of the surgeon with an instrument. And it has to be automatic, otherwise it's not going to be any good. And Professor Crock said, well, you know, don't make it automatic because we need to have then some kind of a switch to open up the, thick, the scissors or the forceps, because I made both. <clears throat> and I said, oh, could use his foot. So I built a foot switch that controlled the instrument, and I was proud as a peacock. And Professor Crock invited me to the conference where all the so-called optometrists and ophthalmologists that were not professors of ophthalmology met every year. And I showed them their mach the machines and so on. And these guys look at me like if I was crazy. <laughs> I was sad. So that's how it started. Tell us about the meeting in Europe that led to your journey to pa Bascom Palmer? That was a wonderful thing because I have to tell you how it happened. Uh, I earned at the time $50 a week and could have never been able, and I had a son to feed and of course a wife. Um, I could have never taken a trip to Europe. Professor Crock was very happy for another reason, for me, for another reason that I built the first ERG room in Australia. He was the first to do electroretinography because there were no such machines. And he called me to his office and, you know, being on the British sides of the Australia, he was always impeccably dressed, jacket, tie, and everything. He took an envelope and he says, JM, if you do not accept this, do not bother to come on Monday. And I got scared, thinking, oh my God, what happened? I opened up, it was a world, round trip world ticket to go to. Europe. He says, go and see your mom. So I ended up and he told me what I was supposed to do is to make a presentation. So I presented on stereo photogrammetry of the fundus. Uh, shaking because I saw all of those very important people 
that were all older than me at the time, uh, better dressed than me, speaking English I did not understand or very little, although Iskandor Dash Prechun and Pocho Palarel Italian on the French. That was insufficient. I had to learn English. So I sat up front. Uh, I was one of the early speakers, made my presentation, and sat back down. And the man next to me said, I was really interested. You did a good job. And I said, and said, thank you. I didn't know how to say very much. And then the guy at the podium said, and now we will have Professor Donald Gass give us a lecture. And the entire audience went. And Donald Gass, who was the gentleman next to me, stood up and gave his lecture. And of course, I had to stay for the whole morning. So they had a coffee break. And I stood up and went to try to get coffee. And there was this man, a little bit older than Dr. Dr. Gans, saying, uh, uh, you did a good presentation. My name is Ed Norton. I need to talk to you for a minute. I know that you're working with Jerry, Professor Clark. Where are you going next? Well, I'm going to go and see my mom in Geneva. And then I'm going to go to Morphine's. And then I'm going to go to Boston. And Dr. Norton said, who are you going to see in Boston? I said, well, Dr. David Donners. I know David very well. And then he asked me, where are you going to next? I said, well, I'm going to go to New York uh, to see, I think it was Dr. Kierman. Cannot remember clearly. And then he said, okay, and then when? I'm going to go and see Dr. Alice McPherson at the Houston, in Houston. She's a good friend of Professor Clark. And then, of course, I had to go to San Francisco to take the plane. So I had to stop and give my regard to another professor at uh, the University of San Francisco. He said, well, I'm telling you, he said, when you get into Boston, do not get out of the airport. You are going to arrive on the second floor. Go one step down, and then you will see a lot of people behind counters. Go all the way to your left. There is a young man with a red hair. Tell him you come to Dr. Norton. You come. Dr. Norton told you to come. And have him change the ticket so that you can stop at Bascom Palmer. I already called Jerry and told him. So Professor Krog by my boss said, OK, I got to do that. And I went there, <laughs> went down, got my ticket changed, saw Dr. Uh, David Donaldson. We talk about stereo photography. Then went to learn in uh, New York INA, I think it was called. And then I end up at Bascom Palmer. And Bascom at the time was a small building with four floors. On the ground floor, the first uh, big room was Dr. Note on the right side when you walk in. And there were four floors, so I met everybody and went up. And when I was in the stairs, about to reach the fourth floor, there was a guy coming down and he says, who are you? My name is Jean-Marie Poirier. What are you doing? And I says, well, I came here because Dr. Norton asked me to. And what are those books that you have under your arm? And I said, oh, this is the work I'm doing in Australia. Can I see them? And he invited me to his office and he looked at everything I'd done. And he asked me about this automated, motorized, autoclavable 
microsurgical instrument. He said, what are these for? And I told him. And he said, how is Professor Kroc doing removing, removing blood from the vitreous? And I said, well, he's putting a ring around the sclera. He sutures this ring. I think it's called a flaring uh, ring. And then he removes the cornea, puts it aside, the nurse takes care of it, and then he uses scissors and forceps and go and cut. And Robert said, why does he open up the eye? Oh, because he learned from Dr. Skeppens. That's how I got the information. Dr. Skeppens told, told him what to do. And Robert, Dr. McElmore at the time, Robert said, have you ever heard of the pulse planner? And I said, no, why? There is no vessel there. So what, couldn't you go with your tiny wind instrument through the pulse planner and do the cutting and remove it? And we discussed, and he invited me to a restaurant that was just next door, down by Scompana, called Lums. So each of us had the beer, and we ate nothing. <clears throat> and there were some, I had no papers with me, uh, left the books with Dr. Norton. But there were napkins. So I started to draw on, nap on napkins. And we discussed being able to get in in opposite direction, bringing fluid and cutting and sucking stuff out. Then I went back to Australia. I put this on these drawings uh, on ink, in black ink, and then for, and then photograph and send these things to him. These drawings are still with me. I still have them there. So if you want to come to Bascom, I will be very happy to show you the very first machine. Now, what comes next is more interesting. Dr. Norton gave me the opportunity to apply for a, a exchange student visa. At the time, you could stay three years, but every year you had to go and knock on the door of the immigration department and get their permission. So I arrived as a student, went to the university when, to learn a bit about physics that I felt I did not know. Essentially, radiation physics. I started to work in the building and build vitrectomy machine and other things. When I arrived the first time, uh, I was with my son and my wife and Robert was on the first floor and he saw me through the glass door. And he went out and asked and helped me to go to the hotel that was known by some farmer to actually uh, stay there. And he says, do you have the machine? Yes, sir. He says, why don't you show it to me? And I see the box. What? Okay, let's go with the box to Bascom. So we went back to his office we looked at it and so forth, tested the foot switch. And he said, does it work on 110 volt? I said, no, it works on 240. But if you give me a screwdriver, I can make it work on 110. And I did this in front of his eye. And he said, okay, uh, can I keep it? Yes, I said, we made it. I made it for you. Okay, so tomorrow we'll come back at about 10 o'clock. I went back at 10 o'clock and we were on the third floor where there was a divarium and the microscope and he had a bunch of human eyes from the Florida Alliance Eye Bank, which was at the time on the same floor. So he started to actually try the surgery. We had no cannula at that time. 
but everything went fine. So I went back home. He had me looking for an apartment and all stuff. And the next morning, I was back in the operating room with him, but this time it was a life rabbit. And uh, that worked too. Although the rabbit had no vitreous membranes, which I was hoping he hooked. No, no vitreous membrane. A week later, the first case in a patient occurred at the Jackson Memorial Hospital. The best compartment did not have an operating room at the time. They were using the hospital uh, next. So I walked in at Dr. Helmut Butner, who came also from Europe, a great guy, a good friend of mine. And uh, Robert entered. We were all scrubbed, I mean, from A to Z. I had set up the microscope. And I thought, wow, this is a fancy microscope. Professor Crop would have loved to have. <laughs> uh, and then Dr. Norton walked in. The patient was already on the table. There was only one door I couldn't escape. So I stayed on the wall, did everything Robert McNamara told me to do to adjust the scope light and things like this. And at the end, he said, okay, thing is finished. Patient is, do, is going to do fine. And Dr. Norton, did not say a word. He just put his fingers and told me, come with the finger. So I went into the ante, an ante room chamber and I was scared. And he said, how, how much do I pay you? I said, I don't know, Dr. Norton, but the immigration department gave me that piece of paper and I pulled it out from the pocket because the immigration told me never lose this. If any police officer asks you who you are, show him this. Otherwise you are going to be in prison. At the time things were really strict. Dr. Norton looked at it and he says, do you have a family? Yes, sir. Children? Yes, sir. How many? One, boy or girl? Boy, he put the, took the phone. Gabby put Perel at 10,000, closed the phone and walked out. I had a 25% increase in salary thanks to that everything went fine with the first patient. I love the sheet. After the first patient, how did things grow after that? Well, first I had to develop my lab. And uh, I, the only place I could do this, there was no room on this fourth floor. The only place was in the basement. And that's where I went. And I started to make sketches, drawing, and a list of things I needed. And every time I made a list, I went to see Dr. Norton and asked permission to go and buy them. And he always said yes. And one day he said, do not bother me with this. Unless it's $500 or more, then you come to see me. Otherwise, you go to see Mrs. Questler. And I had uh, an engineer, uh, Willie O'Meyer, and Willie was working for Mattel, he, he was it's a mold maker. So he knew about mechanics and engineering and helped me. Uh, and we actually purchased the right equipment to do more retractor machine. We did a total of 10 different machines, 10 prototypes if you wish. In the meantime, in September 1970, Robert, one of the case was difficult. And he says, the light source you put under the microscope, which was actually a slit lamp. And he or his, his uh, 
a system and to actually move the light to get the proper angle to go in there so you would have light uh, over the retina. Uh, and I thought he said something about, would be nice if we could put it inside the eye or something like that. So I knew about fiber optics, right? I was working physics, optics. And in September of that year, I came up with the first fiber optic bundle attached to the disc. And he tested it, he was very happy about it. It's not make, it's not doing any inner flight. <laughs> anyway, so it's a long story. The best was on a personal standpoint. When I finished this, I went to Dr. Norton's office and asked Yvonne Karenberg, his secretary, uh, do you know when Dr. McAmel is? Oh, McAmel is uh, in Las Vegas. I said, well, I finished this piece of equipment and maybe Dr. Norton would be interested. Is, she said, yeah, he's there. Go on. So I showed Dr. Norton the disc, the first disc with intraocular illumination. And that was very easy to do. He looked at, at this and he says, Ivan, put Parel on a plane. He goes to Las Vegas. He said, you will show this to Robert. Robert will tell you whether it's good or not. I got first invitation to actually go to the American Academy of Ophthalmology. Photodynamic therapy on the fourth, on, in my operating room on the second floor. So you have your own operating room? I had no choice because the Anbetlich High Hospital, when it was completed in 76, and the operation rooms were ready before actually the second, third, and fourth floor were built and fifth floor. Uh, there was more space in, in, in the McKnight building. So you know what I did, right? I grabbed everything I could and we were designing new things, building new things, uh, all kinds of stuff. So I created on the second floor, the Ophthalmic Biophysics Center operating room, which is better equipped than what you have. <laughs> I'm sure that's oh, true. No, it's a joke. No, you have fast. <laughs> but so, I do have OCT. I can look through the sclera and pass planner. So tell us about the activities in the machine shop at Baskin Palmer? Uh, we have everything, every instrument, including molding, cutting, welding, soldering, sandblasting. We could computer control engraving systems. And of course, uh, plastic injection. Brilliant people knowing how to use these. Thinking back to the production of the VISC, how did you choose who to give it to? I didn't, Dr. Norton. He was extremely generous. And one day he said, you know, there are many patients that need this type of surgery. And this patient cannot afford to come down to Ascom Palmer. So what we need to do is to actually teach surgery to other clinicians so that they can actually improve their patient care vision. I would like you to do 10 vitrectomy machine. We had the VISC-7 generated. And so I did. He paid for everything. We were very happy, Robert McCormer and him, and Dr. Norton, and probably Dr. Gass, selected a German, a Japanese, and eight American physicians to come to Bascom Palmer. He told them all, you go and stay at the hotel on Kibiske. It's really great. You will have fun. Take your wife with you. And Robert um, 
gave demonstration with Helmut Rittner of how the machine works and so forth. They tried on caliber tissue and then went to the third floor, not all of them at the same time, and actually were able to use these machines on rabbits and so on. And then they left. And uh, I asked Robert, where are the machines? He said, you didn't know? I said, what? Dr. Norton just told them to take them with, with them. And then guess what? Well, that was not enough. So Dr. Norton came back, said, you did a good job, but you need to do more. There are more people that need to be able to use a machine. So here we went again, did the same thing. And said, so Dr. Norton, this cost you a fortune. Why don't you charge them for it? Why? You don't understand, it's very important for someone else to come up with ideas and they give it to you so you can make more stuff, modification of the machine. And one thing, when some problem occurs, they are going to call you, they're not going to call me. <laughs> so, I mean, I could tell you more about that. But... Well, they would probably contact you to troubleshoot if there was um, difficulties with the instrumentation. Yes, correct. And that they did. And they shipped their instruments or brought them back and we fixed them every time it, <laughs> it went back. And you mentioned that the VISC never malfunctioned. Except when you dropped it on the floor. And I hate to tell you, this happened or sometimes people would take the machine and go forward and it would hit the metal of, of the instrument uh, case. Yeah. And it was from there. Look, <laughs> creativity was allowed. I didn't have to worry about funding. Uh, people were really great. I mean, I don't know if you had the chance to meet Dr. Norton or Dr. Gass or Dr. Curtin or Robert. So you didn't know that Dr. Gass every month had a Friday on Kibiscane at his home where everybody was invited. Hmm. Not only just from the bathroom, but all of the residents were invited, the fellows, it's great time. At the time when you created the instruments, uh, could you foresee that this is going to be the mainstay for vitrectomy for the next at least 50 years? No. I didn't think that there were so many patients needing vitrectomy. Ophthalmology was not well known. If you think of it, the one in Geneva didn't exist. There was no department of ophthalmology. Only in Bern, you know, the hospital for the eye, organ clinic. In Paris, though, that was a different story. And I spent a lot of time in Paris at the Hotel Dieu Hospital with great people. That's why we actually transfer medication to the retina using coolant control iontophoresis. No injection, just place a little cap on top of the eye, push a button on the machine and Three minutes later, you had whatever you need, either into the retina, not onto, but into the retina. 
Which one? Over the, those years, were there gaps in the technology that you're hoping will can be addressed now? No gap in the technology. Uh, what you're talking is gap in what cannot be treated, right? High number of gaps. Lots of them to address, but they are more on the medical side of, of it than the surgical side. If we fast forward 20 years, uh, do you imagine what technology would be ideal for the field? I think in 20 years, robots will replace surgeon. But a surgeon will still be, shall I say, connected with the machine for surgery to be done. And what um, advice do you have for future generations of inventors? I don't know. I mean, be open-minded. Uh, do your best to try to help solve problems. Use what you know. Don't be scared.